Um, Lip Pozdrav, welcome to the um, talk of Richard Stallman. We are really um, honored that he is here. So I don't think actually that it's necessary to introduce him, but I will still do this. So uh, Dr. Richard Stallman launched the free software movement in 1983 and started the development of the GNU operating system in 1984. And it's a free software. Everyone has the freedom to copy it and redistribu redistrib redistribute it, I'm sorry, with or without changes. The GNU Linux system, basically the GNU operating system with Linux added, is used on tens of millions of computers today. Salman has received an ACM Grace Hopper Award, a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award, and the Talkida Award for Social Econ Economic Betterment as well as several honorary doctorates. So, very welcome, and yeah, I give the floor to you. I hope I won't be expected to pick up this floor and carry it away with me. It's probably too large. I would need a lot of help. Um, the reason people started inviting me to speak is because of my work for the free software movement. Free is in freedom. And developing the GNU operating system that most people erroneously call Linux. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk responds to a question that people often ask me at the end of a talk about free software. Do those same ideas apply to anything else other than software? In order to make that question meaningful, I have to start by telling you briefly the ideas of free software. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. The first case we call free software, because in order for the users to have effective control over the program and what it does for them, they need certain freedoms in their use of the program. So if the users have these freedoms, these essential freedoms, then they control the program. They control it individually, but they also control it collectively in, a, in whatever groups they form. Those groups have control over the group's version of the program. And then individually, people can change it for themselves, so they have the most direct control over the program as they individually use it. But if the users don't have the essential freedoms, then the program controls the users. But there's always some entity that controls the program and through it controls the users. So a non-free program is invariably an instrument of unjust power, a system of digital colonization that keeps people divided and helpless. They're divided because they're forbidden to distribute the program, and they're helpless because they don't have the source code, so they can't change it. They can't even determine what it really does. So, for justice, we must eliminate non-free software. First step is personally to escape from it, to come and live in the free world that we have built. But our ultimate goal is that all users of computing be free and have control of their computing and the elimination of proprietary software. What are the essential freedoms? There are four of them. A program is free software for you if you, as a user of the program, have these four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing as you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community 
which is the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. In order for the program to be free, it must give all four of these freedoms. I try to put them in a meaningful order, but they're not levels of freedom. They're all equally essential. And if any of them is missing or insufficient, that means the program restricts users unacceptably and is unethical. So this is not a technical distinction. Any piece of code could be free or could be non-free. This is not a question of what features it has, not directly. It's not a question of how it works. It's not a question of how that code was written. It's a question of the ethical, social, and political arrangements for the way people are allowed to use that code. And that's what makes it a crucial issue for everyone. The technical questions we could leave to the technical people doing a certain job. But these ethical questions directly affect everyone that uses it and therefore must be everyone's concern. The use of a free program in society is development because a program embodies knowledge and in a free program that knowledge is available for the users to understand then maintain, adapt, and extend, and also use in other ways. But the use of a proprietary program in society is not development at all because it's dependence. Imposed dependence on a particular entity. And that is a social problem. If we see people using a non-free program, we should try to help them stop. And in general, we should try to discourage use of that non-free program because that use is a social problem. To write a free program is a contribution to society, more or less. How much? That depends on the technical details. Some programs are very useful, some are not worth even thinking about. But at least if it's free software, it's distributed in a, in a way that permits it to contribute whatever it has to offer. However, writing a non-free program is no contribution to society because it's a power grab. It's an attempt to lure other people into losing their freedom and becoming users of that program. That is harmful conduct. If the program has attractive features, those are the bait for the trap. Paradoxically, they don't make it better, they make it more harmful. So, if you have the choice to write a non-free program or do nothing at all, or if you have the choice to support or help the development of a non-free program or do nothing at all, it's better to do nothing at all because that way you don't do harm. I understand that in real life, you'd probably have other alternatives that might be better than both of these. But if it's just these two, do nothing. <clears throat> if this were a talk about free software, I'd now go into more detail about the reasons why each of these four freedoms is essential. Suffice it to say, in this talk, that they must apply to all kinds of activities in life, including business. A program that says it's free for non-commercial use is misleadingly described. It is not free software. But that these four freedoms are not compulsory. The point is you've got to be free to do them if you wish. You're not required to do any of them. You have the freedom to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. You could also decide not to run it at all. 
You have the freedom to study and change the source code, but it's not required. Most users, most of the time, get a free program from some place they trust, and then they run it without looking. Looking at the source code is something you do when you've got a specific motivation to do it. And sometimes people have that motivation. Often, they'd rather not do that. They have other things to do. You're free to redistribute the the software, but it's not required in any particular case. We don't say you must distribute copies to so and so or to certain kinds of people in certain cases. The point is you must not be forbidden to do so. You must be free to cooperate with others when you feel like it. We are opposed to any attempt to, to intrude and divide people. But we are not communists and we don't say you must cooperate with so and so. <clears throat> and with freedom three, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions, that's not required either. You can make a modified version and use it privately. In some cases, we might think, you might even think, that that modified version could contribute so much to the community that you have a moral duty to make it available to people. But free software doesn't say you must make your modified versions available. The point is that you must not be forbidden to do so. So, I started the free software movement in 1983. And I launched the development of the GNU operating system in 1984. Because free software, as just an abstraction, just as a, a nebulous future goal, wouldn't change much. The only way we could be free in using computers was to have enough free software to do everything so that we could reject non-free software as a real policy, so that we could escape from it for real. So I launched a project to do that. And the first step is write a free operating system. An operating system is something that you find in every computer. There's always some operating system. It does the usual tasks, and it provides a platform for running other programs to do other more specific tasks. So GNU is an operating system. And its goal is to be entirely free software. And its name is a joke. The name is GNU's Not Unix. And that was a customary way in the hacker community around 1980s-ish to give credit. If you wrote a program that was similar to some existing program, you could give credit by saying this program is not the other one. So I decided to develop a Unix-like operating system and to give credit to Unix for its technical ideas, I called the system GNU's not Unix or GNU. But the other reason for choosing that name is that it's the most humor-charged word in the English language. Because according to the dictionary, the G is silent and it's pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you get a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, but there are lots of them. So people have been conditioned to associate this word with humor. People see this word and they're almost ready to laugh. They're primed to laugh. So I couldn't resist. But when it's the name of our... By the way, GNU is a joke because it's, the, it's a word. It's the name of this animal that lives in Africa. If it didn't have other meaning, it wouldn't be a joke. So when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Please call it GNU. If you speak of the new operating system, you'll get people confused since we've been working on it for 20 years and using it for 20 years so it's not new anymore.
Now, you won't hear people talk about GNU very much, not even if they're using it. Unfortunately, in 1992, somebody else provided the last missing piece of the system, which is called the kernel. And his kernel in 1991 was proprietary. It's called Linux. But in 1992, he decided to make it free software. And at that point, it filled the last gap in the GNU system, which was almost complete. But people got confused and started calling the whole thing Linux and giving him the credit for what we had done in the years before that. And that's how it happens that millions of people are using our system and they don't know it's the GNU system. They think it's Linux and it was started by Mr. Torvalds. And I ho ask you, therefore, please call it GNU plus Linux. If you call it Linux, you're giving the system's principal developers none of the credit. If you, if you call it GNU plus Linux, you give us equal mention. I think it's fair to ask for that much, and we need it. Because we are a campaign for your freedom. And in order to advance the campaign, we need people to find out about it. When people hear the system is Linux, they associate it with Mr. Torvalds and with his ideas. And it happens that he takes an apolitical, amoral approach to this question, which he has a right to do. But it's important for people who think about the system to know that it exists because of a, an explicit campaign to give them and you freedom. Because then they may think about the issue of their freedom. And they may learn that it's important and they may learn to fight for it. And then maybe we'll win and we won't lose it. Because freedom is frequently threatened. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this talk. I'm almost done talking about free software. There are two specific points I want to mention. Starting in 1998, a large part of the free software community doesn't say free software. Instead, they use a different term, quote, open source, unquote, a term I don't use because it doesn't even hint at an ethical issue. And that's the way they wanted it. That's why they made up that term and used it. And they, can, given a, a new term that had never been used, they associated it with, they could decide which ideas to associate with it and which ideas to leave out. They left out completely the idea that there is an issue of right and wrong. That they, they chose not to say that if a program is not open source, that means it mistreats you. That's, in fact, they don't want that idea to come up, and they have gone out of their way to avoid it. But that's the most important point. If people don't hear that, I, I don't want to speak looking at the camera. Oh, oh, okay. I, I didn't understand. It's better to be explicit. I don't understand hints. You've got to say, we're changing the tape. Then I'll know that we're changing the tape. <laughs> Take me past your leader. Is it, is it ready? OK. <clears throat> so their goal was not to present this as a matter of, of ethical or unethical release of software because they didn't want to criticize on ethical terms the usual industry practice. They thought that might be off-putting to corporations. So you could regard open source as a corporate-friendly co-optation campaign. I wasn't as politically experienced back then. I didn't realize I should expect an, a corporate-friendly co-optation campaign to come along at some point. Oh, well. <clears throat> so if you want to help our cause, 
the way you do that is by alluding to freedom. Uh, I don't know how to say free in Slovenian, but in I know that in uh, Serbo-Croatian it's uh, Slobodan, and in Russian it's Svobodni, and in Italian it's Libero. Uh, in other words, it's free as in freedom. If your language has a word that specifically means free as in freedom and doesn't refer to price, that's a better word, so use it. The, wor the English word free is somewhat flawed. Unfortunately, it's the best word we've got in English. What? Po what is? I can't hear it. Speak louder. I can't. Prosto. And what does prosto mean? Oh, that's not, I'm afraid that's more like open source. It's the wrong word. Well, how would you say free press? What? I think you better say Slobodny. No, it, you, it, you better say Slobodny. Prosto is the wrong word. Ah, but free entrance is the wrong... This is not the right analogy. Think of free speech. That's, it's that kind of issue. Just as free speech is the, refers to having the freedom to speak, then this is software that gives you the freedom to do computing as you wish and to cooperate with others in doing so. Because the users must have control both individually and collectively. Giving each user individually control is not enough. It has to be collective as well. And the reason is that most users don't know how to program. If we, could, if we only gave users enough freedom to personally study and change the software, this would do no good for all those non-programmers, including perhaps many of you. But when the control also is available to any group of people, then the non-programmers are included in the benefits. Let me show you with some examples how this happens. Non-free software is full of malicious features. These features typically things such as surveillance of the user, they restrict the user, those are called digital handcuffs or digital restrictions management, and there are back doors that receive commands from others and do things to the user without asking permission. These are wide, so widespread that they are the usual case. If somebody is using non-free software, Almost certainly he's using some naughty software with malicious features. Let me prove this with a few examples. One proprietary package in which people have found all three of these kinds of malicious features that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> in fact, Microsoft Windows has a back door allowing remote imposition of software changes. Microsoft can forcibly change the software without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. So this means Microsoft is universal malware. Any malicious feature that anyone, that Microsoft could think of, if it isn't in Windows now, it could be installed tomorrow. So any program with malicious features is malware. Windows is not just malware, it's universal malware. Mac OS is where to. It has digital handcuffs. The iThings, Apple's newer computer products, are much nastier. They have surveillance features. People keep finding surveillance features in them. They have the tightest digital handcuffs ever invented. Apple seized control even over the user's installation of applications, pioneering the computer as jail. 
and they have a back door. Flash Player is malware. It has a known surveillance feature and known digital handcuffs. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not free. So what significance does, this, does the lack of a price have? It just means Adobe does not make people pay to be abused. <laughs> so if a website uses Flash, complain. And the Amazon swindle is malware. It's designed, but, but I'll, it's designed to take away readers' traditional freedoms, but I'll talk more about that later. Most cellular phones have malware in them with a surveillance feature and a universal back door that allows software changes to be remotely installed, and that has been used to remotely convert them into listening devices. You've heard of software that has bugs. This is software that is a bug. <laughs> well, I've just given you examples which include almost all users of non-free software. So I've proved my point. No speculation, no extrapolation needed. So how can we pr protect ourselves from malicious features in the software we use? There is only one known defense, and that is free software. Because with free software, some of the users are programmers. And from time to time, they look, some of them look at that source code for whatever reason. But in the process, they have a chance to spot a malicious feature. And if anyone finds out that there's a malicious feature, they can can fix the program, they can get rid of the malicious feature, which is basically impossible with proprietary software. That's why, even though I know that Windows has certain malicious features, users have not made a version of Windows without those malicious features, because they don't have the source code. They couldn't change it, and in, beyond just changing it, they'd have to publish the modified version, so all the other users could get it. So this is why those freedoms are essential. If you were using a non-free program and you don't know how to fix it yourself, other users of the same program do know how, and they will fix it to protect themselves. And when they do, they'll announce the changed version, and that will protect you. So the community of users of the program, the ones who know how, protect the whole community. But in order to do that, they need the four freedoms. With proprietary software, we are simply at the mercy of the developer, which is typically a corporation, often a large corporation. And they say, well, of course you know you can trust a large corporation like us. How could you possibly say that a corporation is less than totally trustworthy? Besides, we say we would never do nasty things to you. <laughs> and you can't possibly disbelieve us, can you? We've never heard of any corporation that mistreated people. So, with free software, we have an imperfect defense. It's not guaranteed, but it's much better than being defenseless and at the mercy of an entity that is that faces a tremendous temptation to use its power to gain more. And that's why these widely used non-free programs tend to be malware, because they're all made by these big companies and they, have, they face this temptation and what else are they going to do except give in to it? The last point I want to make about free software is that educational activities must 
teach exclusively free software. Now, a museum is a kind of educational activity. If you have computers for the user, for visitors to use, those computers should be running only free software so that they teach users free software rather than teaching them and encouraging non-free software. Many proprietary software developers offer gratis copies of their non-free software to schools and educational activities. And why do they do this? It's because they want to use those activities to impose dependence on society. So they provide gratis fees so that the activity will teach people to use them. And in the process, those people become dependent. And afterwards, they're still dependent. And then, so after they graduate from the school, the developer doesn't offer them non gratis copies of this non-free program. And some of them go to work for companies. The developer doesn't offer those companies gratis copies. So it's like handing out gratis needles full of addictive drugs, saying the first dose is gratis. Once you're dependent, then you have to pay. Well, schools and museums have a social mission. And teaching dependence on proprietary software is counter to that mission, so they must not do it. They must educate people as free software users so that they are prepared to live in a free society instead of an obstacle to a free society. There is, however, a deeper reason for the education of the best programmers. Some people are natural born programmers. At typically 10 to 13 years old, they're fascinated and they want to know how every program works. But when these kids ask the teacher, how does it do this? If that program is proprietary, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, we can't find out, it's a secret. And thus, education is not allowed. Excuse me. I realize I'd better take this now. Thus, a non-free program is the enemy of the spirit of education and therefore any honest educational institution must say it is not permitted to be there. However, if the program is free, the teacher can explain whatever he knows and then say, here's a copy of the source code, read it and you'll understand everything and those kids being fascinated, will read it, trying to understand everything. And the teacher can say, if you come across any point that you can't figure out for yourself, show it to me and we'll figure it out together. And that gives our natural born programmers the chance to learn a crucial lesson. That code is badly written. You shouldn't write it that way. You see, natural born programmers are clever and they can write lots of code that nobody else, that works correctly, but no one else will understand it. To become good programmers, they need to learn not to write that way, but they need to learn what that way is. They need to learn all the different ways of writing code that will be hard to understand in order to learn to avoid them. The way you become, you learn to write good, clear code is by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software gives you the opportunity to read the code of large programs we really use and then write changes in them, which is the way you learn to handle the difficulties of code for large programs. Before the day you can write a large program yourself and do a good job, you need to make changes in existing large programs and learn to do a good job. So every school can offer this opportunity, but only if it's a free software school. And 
I think that every museum, if it has an exhibit that involves software, should show the source code of that source of that software as free software to allow people who are interested to understand what's going on. <clears throat> but there is an even deeper reason for moral education, education in citizenship. Because it's not just enough to it's not enough just to teach some topic or skills or facts. We need to do we need to teach the spirit of goodwill, the habit of helping your neighbor, the practice of sharing knowledge. Therefore, every class ought to have the following rule. Students if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share it with the rest of the class, including the source code, in case someone wants to learn. Because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, if you can't share it with source code, you can't bring it here. Of course, the organization has to follow its own rule to set a good example. It must bring only free software to the class and share it with everyone in the class. So, at the end of a talk on free software, people ask me, do the same ideas apply to anything else? Now you know what the ideas are. You can understand the question. Often they ask me, what about hardware? Well, there are no copiers for hardware, so strictly speaking, it doesn't make sense as a question. But nowadays, there are starting to be 3D printers. You can give them a file, which is a, a kind of design, and it will make an object. Well, if the object, uh, well, well, this design is something we could ask about. Should it be? I'll cover that in the main body of the speech towards the end. Uh, so, but this technology is just in its infancy. If you look around this room, most of the objects we can see here can't be made today by a 3D printer. In the future, perhaps, but that can take care of itself. You see, when we apply, well, when we judge an ethical question, we do it by applying our basic principles to the various possible choices and their consequences. A change in the context can, which includes a, a change in, in technology, can alter the consequences of a particular choice and that can make it more good or more bad than it used to be. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so bad. The judge would say, I sentence you to pay for his body. In the US, we would all need to have uninsured killer insurance. But in civilized countries, the National Health Service would take care of it. <laughs> So, yes, if we made all the objects we used with 3D maker technology, then we'd be making all our useful objects from files. And those files would be an example of the kind of thing for which this, for which the, this question is meaningful, namely works that we have copies of. Because given our computers, we can copy, we can make more copies, and we can change them too. And because we can do those things, the question of whether we're allowed to do those things is a real and important question. And that's the real question here. Now, until recently, if you had a copy of a work that was not a program, Almost certainly, the only thing that might restrict you from doing anything with it was copyright law. So, 
and all this is starting to change because they're starting to impose end user license agreements on published works other than software. So maybe someday I'll have to change the title of my talk and redesign it some. But for the most part, it's copyright law. So we can ask the same question from the other direction by saying, what should copyright law say about what we can do with our copies of published works? For this, it's useful to look at the history of copyright law, which is connected closely with the history of copying technology. Copying began in the ancient world when it was done by reading one copy and writing another. Now, this technology was very slow, but it had other interesting characteristics as well. For one thing, it had little or no economy of scale. To make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long, approximately, as making one copy. Second, it required no special equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. Third, it required no particular skill other than literacy itself. The result was decentralized production of copies. Wherever there was a copy and someone wanted to make another, he might. In the ancient world, there was nothing like copyright. If you had a copy and you wanted to write another copy, nobody said you couldn't do that except perhaps if the low potentate didn't like that book, in which case he might do horrible things to you. It was not exactly copyright, but rather censorship. The two have had a close historical relationship, but they're not the same. So that went on for thousands of years, but then there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press. The printing press made copying much more efficient, but in a non-uniform way. In the age of the printing press, mass production copying and one-off copying were both slow. Well, sorry, in the ancient world. But in the age of the printing press, mass production copying got much more efficient but one-off copying did not benefit. The fastest way to make one copy was to write it by hand. However, the printing press was a big improvement if you wanted to make many copies. The reason is the economy of scale in the use of the printing press. It took a lot of work to set the type for a page. But once that was done, you could quickly make many identical copies from it. In addition, the printing press and the type were expensive equipment. Most people who were literate did not own a printing press. They also didn't know how to use one because using a printing press is a different skill from reading and writing. The result of this was a centralized system of production of copies. Copies of any work were made in a few places and then transported to where somebody would want to buy them. Copyright originated after the printing press. It was an age when rulers made a habit of giving out various sorts of monopolies to all and sundry that they wished to reward for whatever reason. So they started handing out monopolies over printing certain books, or maybe even printing any books. Copyright in England, which is, I think, more or less at the root of today's copyright, started as a system of censorship. 1553, I believe, under Queen Mary, who wanted to censor Protestantism and was willing to kill to do so. So this law said that in, to be allowed to publish a book, one had to ask the state for permission. And that permission was granted as a perpetual monopoly 
to one publisher. By the way, I just remembered something I should have said to you at the beginning. If you take photos of me, please do not put them in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a surveillance engine. It, good, I don't either. Facebook is not your friend. But if you post a photo in Facebook, Facebook asks people to give names to whoever is in that photo. So just posting the photo helps Facebook collect information about the people that are in it. I don't want you to do that to me, and I could raise the question of whether that's a good way to treat your friends. But I only insist about me. And if you are making a recording audio or video and you want to distribute copies, that's okay provided you do it in a format that is friendly to free software. That is one that isn't patented and is implemented in free software. And that means the AUG formats or WebM, not MP3, not anything MPEG, and certainly not Flash. And also, please put the Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives license on it. The reason for no derivatives is that this is a statement of my opinions. So, getting back to the main topic, cop the copyright system of censorship was allowed to lapse in the 1680s. So the publishers pleaded to get their monopoly back. But what was done was somewhat different. It gave a monopoly to the author for 14 years, which could be renewed once if the author was still alive. So the idea developed that copyright was a system to encourage authorship, encourage people to write. and that in this way it was meant to benefit society. When the US Constitution was written, there was a proposal to say that authors were entitled to a copyright, but this was rejected. Instead, the Constitution says, Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and the useful arts by reserving to authors and inventors for a limited time, the, respective view, the exclusive use of their respective writings and discoveries. So we can see three things in this. First of all, copyright is not required, it's optional. Second, if it exists, it's for the purpose of promoting progress. It's not an entitlement for the author. And third, it has to last for a limited time. Ever since then, publishers have been trying to convince us to forget those decisions, which I think were wise. However, in the age of the printing press, copyright was not very controversial because it functioned as an industrial regulation on publishers controlled by the authors, but designed to provide benefits to the general public. And because of this, it was mostly uncontroversial, easy to enforce, and arguably beneficial. It was mostly uncontroversial because it was only enforced against publishers. Ordinary readers were never restricted by it, so they never had anything to complain about. It was easy to enforce because it only had to be enforced against publishers, and it's easy to find out who's publishing a book. You go to the bookstore and you say, where did these copies come from? And it didn't require invading everybody's home, everybody's computer, or everybody's internet connection. But in addition, it was arguably beneficial for society uh, because notionally the public had traded away part of its natural right to copy anything. But it was a part of right that the public was not in a position to exercise and thus was valueless. 
But in exchange, it got real value, more books written. So it was considered an advantageous trade, advantageous for the public, but also advantageous for the authors. And if we were still in the age of the printing press, I don't think I would be campaigning against it. But the age of the printing press is gradually giving way to the age of the computer networks. Another advance in copying technology, which once again makes copying more efficient and once again in a non-uniform way. The situation in the age of the printing press was this, mass production copying very efficient and it became even more so uh, starting in the late 1800s and one-off copying still very slow. With digital technology we get this. Mass production is more efficient but what's really benefit is one-off copying. It's now almost as efficient as mass production copying. They're not exactly equal, but one-off copying is now so efficient that hundreds of millions of people do it. Which brings us back to a situation more like the ancient world, in which copies can be made in a decentralized way. However, not everyone wants us to get the benefit of being able to make copies. Publishers don't want us to, be, to realize the benefits of digital technology. They want to keep those benefits in their own hands and dribble them out to us under their power. In effect, digital technology changes the effect of copyright law even if the words of the law had not changed. The effect would be totally different instead of an industrial regulation on publishers controlled by authors set up to benefit the public we now have an intolerable restriction on the public controlled mainly by the publishers with a little trickle down to the authors therefore it is no longer uncontroversial people are now starting political parties to fight against it it is no longer easy to enforce because now it requires invading everybody's home, everybody's computer, and everybody's network connection. And in Europe, they're busy setting up the invasion of everybody's network connection and draconian measures, which are the only measures that can conv possibly convince people not to do something as useful and easy as copying. And it is no longer beneficial to the public because the freedom that we traded away and didn't care because we didn't know how to use it anyway, now we can exercise and we want to exercise it. So what would a democratic government do in this situation? Government of the people, by the people, for the people. It would say the freedom that was traded away for our citizens must be recovered for them. They have to have this freedom. In the present situation, it's intolerable not to have this freedom, so we're going to take it back for them. We can measure the sickness of democracy around the world by the tendency of governments to do the exact opposite. That's government of the people by the flunkies for the corporations. And they're doing what the corporations most interested in this question want them to do. And those corporations are the publishers. So they're doing what the publishers want. They are making copyright law more strict just when they ought to be relaxing it. This shows up in the dimension of time. How long should copyright last? They keep making it last longer and longer. Uh, just recently, there was a big extension in the length of time that copyright on a sound recording lasts in Europe. And there wasn't, I'm sad to say, 
a big popular movement saying, don't take away our, any more of our rights. There was opposition, but it wasn't a big enough movement to stop this. The European Union turns out to be a powerful engine for giving business what it wants, a powerful enemy of democracy. The idea of the European Union was a beautiful dream because we imagined that it would be a, de a democratic system, but it isn't. So, the worst example is Mexico, where copyright lasts for a hundred years after the author's death. In the U.S., in 1998, they extended copyrights by 20 years on all past and future works. How they claim to promote the making of past works by extending their copyrights retroactively, I do not understand, unless they have a time machine. But if they have a time machine, why don't they use it? We don't see, apparently they haven't used it, because our history books don't tell us that in 1923, when artists found out that their copyrights would be extended by 20 years in 1998, as well as extended other times before that, that they set to work with renewed vigor. <laughs> Why don't they use their time machine and get us more beloved classics? Now, extending copyright on future works in principle might encourage making more of them, but only for artists who are indeed crazy. Because any rational person wouldn't care. Economists will explain that the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting 50 years after your death is too small to affect your rational decisions today. So why did they pass this law? There were businesses that recognized that they had lucrative monopolies that were slated to expire, like Disney, which realized that the copyright on the first films which had Mickey Mouse in them were going to expire. And once that happened, other people could draw Mickey Mouse as part of their artistic work. And uh, since Disney has obtained a tremendous amount of value from the public domain, it appreciates how important the public domain is and is firmly determined never to contribute anything to it. So companies like Disney purchased that law. That's how laws are made in the US, which is why they deserve so little respect. What moral authority does a law have that was purchased by companies? no more than those companies do. <clears throat> so they purchased this law to extend copyright by 20 years, which means that in 2018, they'll be back in the same situation, and somebody guessed that they'll probably try to do the same thing again, and called this perpetual copyright on the installment plan. Every 20 years, extend copyright by 20 more years. They, the movie companies want perpetual copyright, but they don't yet have the power to amend the US Constitution. So they have to pretend at any given time that copyrights will expire. But if they manage to keep extending them forever, then no copyright will ever expire again, and that's their goal. However, even more important than the dimension of length is the dimension of breadth. Which uses of a copyrighted work does copyright cover? Well, in the age of the printing press, that was not supposed to be all uses. In the space of all things you could do with a published work, which 
which was initially uh, entirely free activity for the readers or users. Copy, activities covered by copyright were an exception. So those were the ones that had been restricted by this law and everything outside people were still free to do. But the publishers have recognized that digital technology, if misused, gives them the opportunity to seize total control and impose a pay-per-view universe. And the way they do this is with digital handcuffs, one of the kinds of malicious software features that you find in non-free software, although they can also be aided by special malicious hardware features as well. And then it's not exclusively in software, almost always requires help from, from non-free software. And the software needs to be non-free in order to achieve their, their evil goal, because their goal is to restrict the users. Now, trying to restrict people through free software is like trying to push somebody by putting pushing a piece of cooked spaghetti against him. It bends too much. It's too flexible. You need something that's hard in order to push people with it, uh, or to tie, you need something that they can't break or bend in order to tie them up with it. So they use non-free software that the users don't control. Instead, it controls them, and this is how they're trying to use that control, to restrict what people do with their copies. So let me, so let me describe what they have done. Uh, the first place where users encountered this outside of software like games was in DVDs. DVDs were designed to restrict the users. The video can be stored in an encrypted format, which was initially secret. It was kept secret by the conspiracy that set up the DVD design and, and implemented the making of DVDs and players. The conspiracy said that if you want to make a DVD player, you must join the conspiracy and you must agree to keep the format a secret and you, you must agree to build your DVD players to restrict the users just like all the other DVD players. Which is why all the DVD players around the world that are actually approved restrict users the same way. And for a while this worked, but then people figured out the format and released a free program that could decode this encryption. The, DVD, the movie companies tried to get the known member of that group prosecuted, but it turns out there was no way to prosecute him because this wasn't illegal. So they began making it illegal. First in the US with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which imposed censorship on that software. There was an actual court case about the free software to play a DVD and the court ruled that distributing that software in the U.S. was forbidden. So the U.S. started the censorship of software, but it has extended to the European Union with the EU copyright directive of around nine years ago. And most EU countries have implemented the directive in a harsher manner than necessary. Although some countries peculiarly have decided that it doesn't apply to the software, the specific software to play DVDs. In Finland, a court ruled that this software being so ubiquitous, it meant that the DVD encryption method was no longer an effective method of restricting the public, and therefore the law didn't apply it. Now that would be nice if we could count on it, if we only had to get a free program sufficiently into distribution to make it legal to distribute, then we could win, usually, but not always. 
when the movie companies discovered that these laws had not actually stopped people from getting the free software to play a DVD, they designed another scheme to, of encryption called AACS, and that is used in Blu-ray discs. Now there is, they thought that it would never be broken, but in fact people did release a free program to decrypt Blu-ray. However, it can't always be used. In order to use, you have to know the key, and they keep changing the key. So that's a battle that can't be won conclusively and permanently. In addition, Blu-ray discs have another level of, of digital restrictions management, which they change, they, they reprogram it every three months or so. They don't all use it, but it's there. And so it will be very hard for the free world to, to keep up with that constantly changing system of restrictions. So it's a mistake to assume that because there's so many of us and we're so clever that we will always defeat the enemy technically. That can't be taken for granted and underestimating the enemy is a a prime act of folly that has often led to defeat. Nowadays, we see movies being distributed over the internet with digital restrictions management, and they could change their digital restrictions management scheme from one day to the next. So it's a tr tremendous challenge to see how anyone could effectively defeat it. We can't assume that we will defeat their handcuffs technically. And we've also seen DRM in music. Around 10 years ago, we started to see things that looked like compact disks, but they were not written following the specs for compact disks. Therefore, we called them corrupt disks. They were CDs, but C stood for corrupt. So people made lists of them to tell other people what not to buy. I once gave a speech like this in Spain, where I had been invited by a regional government agency. Of course, they gave me afterwards some books with beautiful photos of the region and some discs of music from the region. One of them I wanted to listen to because it was by a musician I had heard of. But fortunately, before I opened the package, I saw that instead of the compact disc logo, it had another symbol. It said, copy control. This disc can be played on Windows and Macintosh systems, which meant not by any computer I would have, the reason it had that symbol is that some European countries ruled that they can't, co they can't put the compact disc symbol on those discs because they weren't writing them according to the specs for a compact disc. So they had to put on something else and that turned out to be useful because I handed that disc back and said, here you see the face of the enemy. Please give this back to the store because they shouldn't get to keep your money. And I've never heard that music. Maybe I never will. But that's okay. That's a tiny sacrifice to make for freedom. <laughs> and we must be prepared to make sacrifices if we want to keep our freedom. Otherwise, somebody make us choose. If we don't choose freedom, we'll lose it right then and there. Now, <clears throat> Sony had a very clever idea for making corrupt discs. Instead of writing the tracks in a strange, wiggly fashion, hoping the computers wouldn't read it, they put a program on the disc. The idea was that if you put the disc into a computer, that program would run automatically, and it would, it would take control of the operating system and install changes to restrict access to all those discs. 
So that program resembled a virus or what a cracker would use to seize control of your computer. It's called a rootkit, and it's illegal. In fact, it's a, it's a serious crime, distributing such software or getting it to run on people's computers without their permission. But that's what Sony did. And it made other changes in the system as well. It undermined security in, uh, in various ways. It changed the part of the system that you could use to ask what's installed in the system so as to disguise its own presence. And it modified another part of the system that you could use to delete it so that it wouldn't really delete that stuff. Sounds more like a virus with every detail. That was one felony Sony committed, but not the only one, because part of this code included a, f it was code copied from a free program that had been released under the GNU General Public License, which is a copyleft license. Uh, and it says, which, which means it says, when you distribute any program containing some of this code, your entire program must be released under the same license. You must give users a copy of the license so that they know their rights, and you must make the source code of your whole program available to them. Sony didn't do any of that, which, meant, which was commercial copyright infringement. And thanks to a law purchased by companies like Sony in the mid-90s, that's a felony in the U.S. Of course, Sony was never prosecuted. U.S. officials understood perfectly well that the U.S. government's job is to maintain the power of those corporations over the citizens. It's a government of occupation for the empire of the megacorporations. So they didn't prosecute Sony, but people did sue Sony, the victims. But Unfortunately, they focused their condemnation not on the evil purpose of putting this rootkit on the disks, but rather only on the other nasty things that were the means Sony used. This meant that Sony was able to settle the lawsuit by promising that in the future it would never, when it restricted the, the, what users could do, it would not practice those means. And Sony learned its lesson because in the PlayStation 3, the rootkit was built in before they sold the product, and it was designed to be impossible to remove, and it's AACS. However, they were defeated technically. Uh, a year or two ago, some people figured out a way to break that particular piece of handcuffs and how to, they were able to jailbreak the machine and install their own choice of software on it. And Sony sent the police after them, which is why we have boycott Sony stickers up there. So. DRM and music, oh, there was one redeeming feature for these Sony corrupt disks. That program that ran automatically would run on Windows. But if you put it into a GNU plus Linux system, it wouldn't bother you at all. But that's no excuse. I mean, if somebody tries to do something extremely nasty, and makes a dumb mistake, and some of the intended victims uh, escape hurt, that's no excuse. <clears throat> DRM on music mostly disappeared a few years ago. What happened was the record companies made a contract to sell through iTunes with DRM, and then they discovered that Apple was in the driver's seat, that Apple had, was in the dominant position and was screwing them. So they had to sell it some other way, but their contract said they could only sell it some other way without DRM, so they did. 
And lo and behold, people bought it and the sky didn't fall. So eventually Apple had to get rid of the DRM also <clears throat> with a little pressure from the Free Software Foundation helping them to encourage, helping to encourage them along the way. And okay, DRM mostly disappeared from music, but it's creeping back thanks to streaming services such as Spotify. They are bringing back digital restrictions management to music. They s transmit the music in a secret encrypted format for the specific purpose of restricting the users. And that's why they require users to run a specific non-free client program. It's non-free in order to restrict the users. There's a specific feature that would be natural to put in, but they don't want it to be there. And that's, that feature is, save this last piece on my disk in a file. The most natural, obvious feature, except they want you to think that because it's streaming, it can't have that feature. That's nonsense. It can have that feature, but they don't want it to have that feature. So out, out, damn Spotify. You've, we've got to spread the word that those features mistreat people, those services mistreat people. You, you mustn't let yourself be at their mercy. You've got to have your own copy that's in a non-encrypted format that you can use as you wish. And then there are books. There's a handout up there about the danger of ebooks. I hope you'll take a copy. <clears throat> you see, now they're applying DRM to books as well. The first attempt was 10 years ago. There was a broad pr public relations campaign to convince us that ebooks were going to be really great. And then they started making ebook players and publishing ebooks. And one publisher had the idea that it could get its line of user restricting ebooks selling with a bang among technophiles if they started with a biography of me. So they found an author who came to ask for my cooperation, and I said, only if this ebook is published without encryption so that people can redistribute it. The publisher wouldn't accept that, so I said no. But a few months later, we found another publisher who agreed and, in fact, wanted to sell it on paper. So <clears throat> it was written and published actually under a free license. Uh, you can download the marked up text and edit it and publish it yourself. But, and so that was nice. Anyway, ebooks flopped a decade ago. Just people didn't like them very much. It would have been really nice if people had rejected them because they didn't want to give up the traditional freedoms of readers of books. But I realized that we, that that would be, uh, we couldn't assume that, that they probably had rejected them for mere convenience reasons and, and that the, uh, the aggressors would fix up the convenience and try to, again to attack our freedom. And they did with products such as the Sony Shredder and the Barnes and Noble Schnook and the Amazon Swindle, which is designed so that it swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously by paying cash. That's not allowed with the swindle because Amazon is the only place to get most books for the swindle, and Amazon does not allow people to pay cash. It does not allow people to buy anonymously, and that means Amazon maintains 
a giant database of all the books each user has read on the device. Such a database threatens human rights. We must not tolerate its existence no matter where. There's no need to ask whether Amazon in particular is a suitable custodian for that data because no one could possibly be. <clears throat> then there's the freedom to give the book to someone else after you read it. The freedom to lend the book to other people. The freedom to sell the book to a used bookstore. Amazon eliminates these freedoms with digital handcuffs together with end user license agreements. Amazon does not respect private property. Amazon says that you can't own a book if you're using the swindle. It says that the books all belong to Amazon and all the reader gets is a license to read it under Amazon's choice of imposed conditions. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish and someday pass it on to your heirs. Amazon eliminates this with a back door. We know about this back door by observation. We don't know everything it can do because we can't see the source code. All we know is what we saw. In 2009, Amazon remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Until that day, those copies were authorized copies. They were obtained in the usual approved manner from Amazon. Until Am they were authorized copies until the day Amazon said they weren't. And because of that, Amazon knew exactly where they were. So Amazon knew exactly where to send the commands to make those books disappear. And the book with which Amazon demonstrated the Orwellian nature of its product was 1984 by George Orwell. If I were writing fiction, I wouldn't dare make it up that way. To to Im improbable a coincidence, people would say, but that's what happened. <clears throat> 1984 is the book that gave us the slogan, Big Brother is Watching You. It describes a totalitarian state whose crimes began with destroying books it didn't like and got worse from there. There was a lot of criticism and Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state, <laughs> which I do not find comforting. You should all read 1984, but not on the swindle. The official name of that product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire, which suggests that the real purpose of the device is to burn our books but I won't let it get mine because I'll never use a device of that kind. I won't get books that way. And I hope you will join me in refusing any ebook that gives me less freedom, but either theoretically or practically than a printed book, I will not accept. And on May 4th, in the Day Against DRM, we're planning to have protests around the world against DRM. If you want to help in the campaign either then or through other kinds of actions, often our actions are done virtually so you can easily do them anywhere, visit defectivebydesign.org, which is the site for our anti-DRM campaign. The companies organize to build these systems to restrict us. We must organize to fight back. 
Now, what is, under what circumstances might Amazon get told by the state to erase people's books? Let me tell you about one. Several years ago, J.K. Rowling and her publisher went to court in Canada and obtained an injunction ordering the people who had bought one of her books not to read it. She literally told people, told her fans not to read her book. Why was a bookstore put the book on display before the date it was supposed to be sold, thus risking damage to a carefully crafted marketing campaign so that perhaps she might have got not quite as many millions of dollars. They, people walked into the store, they saw the book on display, they bought it and they left. And she couldn't find out who they were. So all she could do was get this order published telling people not to read it. And also forbidding them in Canada to publish some juicy secrets from the plot. Well, I got somebody to uh, tell me them and I published those. Not that I care much about Harry Potter, but an or uh, just because it was important to defy something as nasty as that. And not being in Canada, I could safely do so. But I also called for a boycott of Harry Potter. I don't say you shouldn't read those books. I leave that to Ms. Rowling. Let her tell people not to read her books. I just say that you shouldn't buy them. You shouldn't pay to see the movie. Borrow the book and read it if you want to read it. Go to a public library. Unfortunately, if you take it out, they'll send her some money, which is a bad thing. Uh, but if you borrow it, but you could read it in the library, you could borrow it from a friend. There are ways that you can read the book and not give her money. Well, now she has a site uh, selling e-books. Or oh, I don't know if she claims that it's really selling them. Maybe it's only uh, giving users licenses to read them. And that system makes users identify themselves. So now, if this happens again, she could really go and erase them. So, <clears throat> I've said that conspiracies of companies are usually responsible for these DRM schemes. The reason for this is that, with a few exceptions, one company by itself is usually not in a position to implement these schemes. It takes various companies working together, publishers and technology companies, so they have to make a conspiracy. And usually they want to let some other companies make players. So they have to invite those other companies to join the conspiracy. But how do I know about these conspiracies? It's because they don't keep them secret. They proudly, these conspiracies have websites where they explain the rules of the conspiracy. They, they say which companies set up the conspiracy. I once visited the website for AACS and saw those things. Conspiracies to restrict the public's access to technology for private gain ought to be a felony, just like conspiracies to fix prices. After all, those can only cost us more money, but the Conspiracies for DRM can attack our freedom, which is much worse. But, in fact, those companies know they have nothing to fear because our governments are on their side against us. Therefore, they 
announce, they proudly announce their conspiracies to restrict us. Well, I want them to go to jail instead of designing technology to put us in jail. But until we can make that happen, we need to work together. So please join DefectiveByDesign.org. What would a democratic government do? One that wants to stand up for what its people want instead of, say, uh, instead of saying we must surrender to the corporations. What's best for you is if we obey them. Well, they would reduce copyright power. But how precisely? First of all, there's a dimension of time. We must make copyright last a shorter period of time. I propose 10 years starting from the date of publication. Why from the date of publication? Because before the work is published, we don't have copies of it. Therefore, it doesn't matter to us whether theoretically we would be allowed to do various things with the copies if we had them. So we might as well let the artist have as long as it takes to arrange population, uh, arrange publication and start the clock then. Why 10 years? Because in the US and some other places, the usual publication cycle was only three years. By three years, almost all books are out of print. Almost all records are out of print. They're, they're gone. So 10 years is more than three times that. It ought to be plenty. It's a tiny fraction of works that would still be in print that long. Not everybody agrees with this suggestion. I once made these proposals in a panel discussion with fiction writers and an award-winning fantasy writer on the panel said, 10 years, that's crazy. Anything more than five years is intolerable. I was surprised too. Until that moment, the publishers had succeeded in fooling me. Because when they demand more power to crush sharing, they, they say this is in the name of the artists. And they may even bring out a few very famous artists who will, who will say, yes, I want more power. And they want us to think that, that these represent all the other artists who, however, were not famous enough to be invited. But that's not true. While the publishers treat those very famous and successful artists very nicely, they grind the other artists into the ground with their heels. And th this writer had experienced that. His book was out of print and his fans were contacting him saying, I want to read this, people tell me it's great, where can I get it? He wanted to send them copies, but he wasn't allowed to because he had transferred the rights, licensed the exclusive rights to the publisher. And the publisher wouldn't let him. Now the contract said that if the book went out of print, the rights would revert to him. But the publisher refused to acknowledge that the book was out of print, even though the fans were saying they couldn't get it. Thus he had a legal dispute with his publisher which was using the copyright on his own book to stop him from distributing copies of his own work. He had reached the conclusion that more than five years of copyright were very unlikely to do him any good, but he saw that they could do him harm. So he said only five years. Well, I'm not insisting on 10 years exactly. I'm suggesting this as a rough adjustment. I have no way of knowing what the best possible length would be. If everyone else prefers five years, I'll go along with it. But I just want to be a little more cautious, so I'm proposing to shrink it down to 10 years. But what about breadth? Which uses of a copyrighted work should be covered by copyright, and what should we be allowed to do?
I think that depends on what kind of work it is. I distinguish three broad categories of works based on the kind of contribution that they make to society. So this is not meant as a value judgment. I'm not saying that one of these kinds of works is more important than another. I'm saying they contribute in different ways. First, there are the works of practical use, works that you use to do a job. Second, there are the works that show what certain people think or thought. And third, there are the works of art and entertainment, whose contribution is in the impact of the work. So, let's look at these one by one. The first category is works that, are, that serve a functional purpose. You use them to get a job done. This does not mean that they can't have any aesthetic aspects, but that's secondary. You know, there are some aesthetic aspects in writing a program, but the main point of that program is what it will do for you when you run it. Programs in this, works in this category include computer programs, recipes, educational works, reference works, fonts for displaying text, and other things. These works must be free. Freedom is having control of your own life. If you use the work to do a job, you must have control over that job, and that means you must have control over the work. The users of the work must have control over it. You've got to be free to use it the way you wish, free to change it so it does the job the way you wish, and then you must be free to distribute copies of your modified work, to publish it, because your version might be better for some other people. They may prefer it, just as you prefer it. They may want to do the job the way you want to do it. So you've got to be free to publish it and provide it to them so that the users can have collective control over the work as well as individual control over the work as they use it. And that leads us to the same four freedoms. But those are not all the works. They're also the works that state what somebody thinks, like this talk, like essays of opinion, memoirs, scientific papers, which are works of testimony. Certain people say, this is what we did, this is what we saw, sign so-and-so. Our, our reputation is at stake if there's anything wrong here. These, for these works, there's no particular reason to allow people to publish modified versions. That would just be misrepresenting the authors. And that means there's no particular reason to allow any commercial use of these works without permission. So I propose a modified copyright system that would cover all commercial use and all modification. But there's one freedom that we must have, and that is the freedom to share. When I say share, I mean non-commercially redistribute exact copies of the work. I believe people must have the freedom to share any published work. So I'm not talking about private personal data here. That's a totally different issue. I'm talking about published works, works that anybody is welcome to get a copy of somehow. So, with this with this partially reduced copyright system that gives us the freedom to share, we will turn copyright back into a tolerable industrial regulation that we can live with. We will end the war on sharing. Because this is what makes the current copyright system intolerable. The fact that 
we are forbidden to do this easy and tremendously useful thing that digital technology allows us to do. And that is sharing. Sharing is cooperation. It builds the bonds of society. To attack sharing is to attack society. And because sharing is good and easy, people will share and only nasty draconian measures could possibly convince them to stop. That's why the publishers and their tame politicians keep proposing and enacting nasty draconian measures because they want to stop us from doing something that's easy and good. So first they started develop they started designing technology with digital handcuffs. But that didn't always work. People broke the digital handcuffs. So they made the laws to forbid breaking digital handcuffs and those laws are completely malicious. Digital handcuffs should be forbidden, not protected by law. But that didn't, all, that didn't really succeed. So then they started suing teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But that didn't entirely succeed either. So their latest thing is to punish people who are sharing by the internet. They find various ways to do this. A combination of imposing censorship on the internet for the specific purpose of blocking people from sharing. Of course, it's easy to block other things too, and it leads to an arbitrary system of sharing. They, they generally set it up so that sites can be blocked without a trial. And they also disconnect people as a punishment for being accused of sharing. Punishment for merely being accused which destroys a basic principle of justice. They're willing to destroy basic principles of justice to get their dirty goals achieved. We must end the war on sharing. And that's why I say sharing must be legal. But there's no particular reason in this category to permit commercial use or modification without authorization. So I propose this somewhat reduced copyright system which will continue to provide some income for the artists in more or less the same lousy, inadequate fashion as today. Except for a few stars, it's lousy and inadequate. And then there's the third category, works of art and entertainment. For these works, modification is a difficult issue because there are valid arguments on both sides. On the one hand, an artistic work can have an artistic integrity and modifying it can destroy that integrity. For proof of this, just look at how Hollywood uh, generally butchers uh, works of fiction. I guess those authors didn't have enough artistic integrity to say no. But on the other hand, there are some exceptions who do, who, who make sure that Hollywood doesn't butcher their works. And they I, apparently have some artistic integrity. On the other hand, modifying an artistic work can be a contribution to art. Consider, for instance, the folk process. And there are many things that uh, people now do with the internet of uh, what they may still call appropriation. I don't, these terms go in and out of fashion faster than I can follow. Uh, and then consider Shakespeare. Some of Shakespeare's plays use stories copied from other works published a few decades before. If today's copyright law had been in effect then, Shakespeare or whoever it was would not have been allowed to perform or publish those plays 
and probably would never have written them uh, with the and, and the copyright holders would have said Shakespeare just wants to make a cheap ripoff of my masterwork and if Shakespeare had never written that uh, we couldn't point at it and say that's not true but since they were written, we can say that they're all important contributions to human literature. And it would be a shame if any of them had been prevented from being written. And then after Shakespeare's works went into the public domain, other works that we consider important and worthy of having been published were made based on them or derived from them in a way. So, um, there is valid argument on both sides. Eventually, I thought of this compromise solution. For 10 years, which is how long I'm proposing copyright should last, this reduced copyright system would be in effect that would cover all commercial use and all modification but everybody would be free to non-commercially redistribute exact copies. And then the copyright would expire and people could publish modified versions. This means that to publish a modified version, you might have to wait up to 10 years. But you can wait up to 10 years. It's not like today where you might have to wait a century and you'd be dead before then. So, that's what I propose, but there's one other issue, and that is remix. Remix means taking parts of various works and putting them together and making something that overall is totally different. It's too different to be considered a modified version of one work, because its whole point is entirely different from any of the works that you might have used pieces of. Well, remix should be legal because the legitimate purpose of copyright is to encourage making more works. To interpret copyright so it becomes an obstacle to making a broad class of interesting works is turning it on its head and that only happens when a law initially made to benefit society gets distorted under the control of private interests that hope to benefit from it which is, of course, what we have. So, in particular, peer-to-peer -peer sharing must be legal. I don't know about services like Mega Upload. After all, they're businesses. I don't know whether Mega Upload was illegal or legal under U.S. law, but in any case, I'm not arguing particularly for services like that, but peer-to-peer -peer sharing doesn't require any particular business to support it. So that definitely is non-commercial and it's got to be legal. Of course, the record companies will say, that's horrible, you're stealing from the musicians, which is nonsense. They stole everything from the musicians, leaving nothing for us to take if we tried. With the exception of long-established stars. Here's how it works. When I buy a commercial CD, I feel ashamed because I know I am not supporting the musicians. Why is that? Because, well, in general, they're not long-established superstars, the musicians who, of the CDs I buy. But the point is, when musicians get a, a record contract, nominally a certain fraction is for the musicians but they never get it because the, co the same contract says that the production and publicity expenses are considered as an advance to the musicians. And this fraction of the price you pay that's supposedly for the musicians goes to, quote, repay the advance. So really it just goes from one account in the record company to another. The musicians don't ever get any of that. And it's almost unheard of that a record sells so many copies that it finishes repaying the so-called advance. 
finance, and that money starts actually going to the musicians. A record can go platinum in the US without reaching that point. It almost never happens. Now, if the musicians finish their first contract, which is typically five or seven albums, and they're famous, at that point they can negotiate another contract which really gives them money when people buy their records. But that's very few. And that only applies to their subsequent music. The initial albums remain forever under the first contract and might still not give them any money. So, um, how do musicians get any benefit from their record contract if they don't become stars? Well, they do get a benefit in a different way. They get to be better known. So they have more concerts and they can charge more and more people come and they can sell merchandise at their concerts and in those, wa in those ways they make more money. But we have other ways of publicizing musicians thanks to digital technology. We can just share their music and we can write, okay, okay. How much did we lose? No. How much did we lose? Oh, so it's still going? Okay, good. I just wanted to know if I had to repeat something. Okay, so by telling our friends, here's something nice, listen to it, we publicize musicians. And this is healthier because it's not, it's not controlled by money. We can get the influence of money out of the spreading of music. So I think that legalizing sharing of music is healthy for music. In addition, another good effect will be to remove those monstrous companies that have lobbied for unjust laws and arranged to sue teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I want them to get what they deserve, which is to disappear. I'm not saying that there's something unjust about making and selling records. And it might be nice if we had a system that really made those that sell records pay the musicians, which mostly they don't. But those particular record companies, the major record companies, there are fewer of them every decade, they keep merging, uh, are, have done such nasty things that they need to be wiped out. I think is uh, a good op a good uh, a good place to apply the corporate death penalty. <clears throat> and what about movies? You've heard astronomical sums for the cost of making movies. Could movies still be made? A producer told me that those costs are actually more publicity than production. And the part that supposedly the production cost is exaggerated through creative accounting, and the real cost of production was probably much less. On the other hand, a lot of use of movies is commercial use and would be covered by my proposed reduced copyright system just as by the current copyright system. Putting those two together, I think they would get the money to make movies. Now, they might not go in for pushing the limit of special effects, but I think we could live without that. In any case, Hollywood systematically produces crap. Now, this is a stronger statement than to say that Hollywood usually produces crap. That's also true. But I'm saying it's due to the operation of a system. I learned about the workings of this system from a book called Save the Cat. 
That book aims to teach people how to write and sell screenplays. I had no intention of trying to do that. I probably don't have any talent for it or the desire. But what I learned from the book was how the system works that arranges for most of the production of Hollywood to be crap. Now, I am completely against censorship. I don't advocate stopping people from making a movie just because I think it's crap. They should have the right to make it anyway. It's not a question of whether they should be allowed to make it. It's a question of whether we should give up our freedom to help them make it. And that's a different story. We should not. Now, oh, and by the way, film production in a lot of countries is very much subsidized as well. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but that's something to keep in mind when you ask whether they could still make movies. <clears throat> so, at this point, you might wonder well, since the existing system is lousy, and I'm just saying that this reduced copyright system would provide almost as much income, well, that would also be lousy. Maybe you'd like to support artists better than the current system. I have two proposals for how to do this, which are compatible with legalizing sharing. One proposal is uh, it would be run by the state. A state agency would get money either out of the general budget or perhaps through a, a tax on internet connectivity or anything, doesn't matter what. And it would distribute this money through specified rules among artists not to businesses, only to the artists, and we should make sure that no businesses can take it away from the artists, because they will try. And then the crucial thing is, how much does each artist get? What I'm proposing is like the existing system in that it's based on their popularity, not juries or bureaucrats or anything. You can measure the popularity without surveillance by polling of some kind. There are various kinds that could be done. And then how do you determine each artist's popularity, how much that artist should get? Well, the most obvious way is linear proportion, but that doesn't give good results. It gives too much to the stars. It's easy for a star A to be a thousand times as popular as a fairly good and appreciated artist B. And with linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much money as B, which means that either B is not getting enough to live on, or A is getting to be super rich. And neither of those achieves the goal. Therefore, I propose we take the cube root of the popularity of each artist. The cube root function looks sort of like that. So, it, since the cube root of a thousand is ten, if A, the star, is a thousand times as popular as capable artist B, A would get ten times as much money as B. Not a thousand times, but ten times. The result of this would be to, that the total amount that goes to all the stars would be a small fraction because they're not that many stars, and they're only getting 10 or so times as much. So the, the money that goes to all the stars put together would be just a small part of the total, and most of the money would go to the artists that really need this help. Thus, because the system is so much more efficient at achieving the goal of supporting the arts, we could do it with a lot less money. And that's why it doesn't matter crucially where, how they would collect the money, because we'd be saving so much 
that we ought to just be grateful that we're saving it. We don't have to worry about exactly how we're paying the amount that they get. The other method I propose is with voluntary payments. Imagine if each player had a button, and you push it and it sends maybe one dollar or you know, half a euro to the artist anonymously. Well, that, my idea is each country would choose the amount. And it would choose the amount to try to maximize the total amount people send per year. And it's a small enough amount that a lot of people wouldn't hesitate. Because it, you know, for you to send half a euro, I'm sure you could all afford to do that once a day. Of course, there are poor people who can't afford to do that, and they won't. And that's fine. We don't need to squeeze money out of poor people to support artists. There are enough non-poor people who will be happy to do it. It feels good when you support an artist. The only reason you'd hesitate is the value of that half a euro. And it's not much of a reason not to do it. Why don't, why don't you do it today? Because it's too much trouble. The trouble is what discourages you, not the value of the money you'd give. So with this proposal, we would eliminate all the trouble. It would be as easy as pie. The only thing to make you hesitate is how much money you're giving. And I think this would work pretty well because people do feel good when they give. But if it didn't send enough, we could have warm and friendly PR campaigns to convince people to give more. Contrast them with the vicious, threatening, uh, insulting PR campaigns that say, if you share, you're a thief, which is false. Uh, legally speaking, sharing is not theft. Uh, but they say it anyway. Uh, and they're, they're trying to scare people out of helping others. But this campaign would only appeal to good emotions. It would say, did you send a half euro to some artist today? <laughs> Why not? It's such a small amount of money. And if you enjoyed listening to it or reading it, push the button. <laughs> You'll feel good. And when people do it, they will feel good. So they'll learn to do it more. So these are my recommended methods of supporting the arts and encouraging sharing. So now I'd like to mention there are stickers up there from about GNU and the Free Software Foundation. There are some I bad stickers, bad for your freedom. Uh, take stickers, they're gratis. Take as many as you can make good use of and put them up where people will see them. I also have some merchandise for sale. Like I have these little buttons, which are two euros, and these big buttons, which are three euros, and these lapel pins, which are 10 euros, and these are metal stickers, basically like this one. They say GNU slash Linux inside, and uh, so you can put them on computer and it won't, they won't rub off. These are two euros. And there's also this adorable GNU, which needs a home. So I'm going to auction it now for the benefit of the Free Software Foundation. Uh, if you buy it, I'd be happy to sign the card or the tag for you. And if you have a penguin, you need to get a GNU for your penguin, because as we all know, a penguin a penguin can't hardly function without a GNU. <laughs> when you bid, please wave your arm and shout the amount you're bidding because it's useless to bid if I don't notice. And we can accept payment either in cash or with a credit card that you can use to make international purchases. So I'm going to start now at 20 euros. Do I get 20 euros? How much? 
30. At 30, do I get 35 or more? Okay, you, have you got a credit card to pay with? I've got 35, do I get 40? Uh, you were first, so I, I've got 40, do I get 45? Do I get 45? I've got 45, do I get 50? I've got 45, do I get 50? I've got 50, do I get 55 or more? Do I get 55 or more for this adorable canoe that needs a home? Do I get 55 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? I've got 55, do I get 60? I've got 55, do I get 60? I've got 55, do I get 60 or more for this adorable GNU that needs a home? To the Free Software Foundation that to, to defend freedom, do I get 60 or more? Last chance, last chance to bid 60 or more. Going, I've got 60. Do I get 65? Do I get 65 for this adorable GNU that needs a home? Do I get 65 or more to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? Last chance, do I get 65 or more? 65 or more, last chance, going, going, I, I've got 65, do I get 70 or more, do I get 70 or more, I've got 65, do I get 70 or more for this adorable GNU to the Free Software Foundation, do I get 70 or more, last chance, going, going, Gone for 65. Please come down. Please come down and pay. And meanwhile, those of you who want to buy something else, please come down. And yeah, hope to see you soon.